Hi, church family. Um, we're coming at you from the Kerr household. Um, and having to put this virtual service together quickly means it might not be a perfect experience, but we're going to do everything we can to provide you with um, hopefully uh, a familiar worship experience to what you get at church with us on Sunday. So we are sad we can't be there with you in person, but um, we hope that you're blessed by the music and that you join in singing um, and you're blessed by the, the teaching that Pastor Gary is going to bring as well. Uh, we love you all and we hope you are uh, resting on God's um, solid foundation. Um, I wanted to start by reading from Matthew chapter 7, which is just a few chapters back for us um, before we sing today. Um, it's from chapter 7, uh, verse 24 and on. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain fell, the rivers rose, and the winds blew and pounded that house, yet it didn't collapse because its foundation was on the rock. So let that be an encouragement to you as we sing this morning.
God, we pray right now that your people gathered um, afar would feel your presence. God, that through the technology and the means that you have given us, that we can bless each other and minister to each other and worship you and know you more. And God, that you would work in a mighty way through this um, uncertain time. Thank you so much that you are on the throne, that we rest on you, that our foundation is built on you and on nothing else. And because of that, we have nothing to fear. We have no reason to be worried. We only, um, God, look for your purpose in this and ask that you would use us to glorify you. In your name we pray. Hello Community Alliance kids. I have a quick announcement just for you guys. We did not forget about you and I um, I know I speak for myself and I'm sure for all of your teachers, we miss you and we're going to miss you. Um, we're gonna miss being with you guys every Sunday morning. Um, and I'm thinking about you and praying for you every day. As you listen to Pastor Gary's sermon today with your parents, which I hope you are doing, um, I made you guys a little worksheet to go through and it is great for all ages so there's some questions so listen carefully to Gary's message and then there's some fill in the blank and then there's a memory verse which you can work on and send a video to me you can have your parents send that to me there's information there but then there's also some other stuff here for older kids as well and then a little drawing sheet for younger kids so I encourage you to work through it let me know if you did it Send me a text message or an email with um, your picture. I'd love to see it because I miss you guys. And if you, um, parents, if you don't have a printer or access to a printer or ink, just send me an email and I'd be happy to mail you guys a copy of next week's um, worksheet for kids too. Um, to access this worksheet, it's, there's a link to it in the email you received from the church, but also in the comment section in the YouTube video, depending on where you're watching this. So bye guys, I miss you. Family. It's been three weeks since I've seen most of you and I have missed you all greatly. And a whole lot of things have happened in those three weeks, hasn't it? It's been sort of surreal, sort of apocalyptic. But God is still on his throne and there is work to be done for the kingdom of God, even in times like this. And so here we are, uh, I am looking out at chairs, not people, but I know that as this video gets watched, you become the people in the chairs. And our family still gathers, even though it's gathering in a very different way than before. So Pastor Gary and I were talking about how he could preach to you all and give you a sermon. And we tried it starting in the living room of our house with him sitting on the couch. And he said, that it felt sort of like a college professor giving a boring lecture. And I watched a little bit of it and he's kind of right. So we're going to do church like you were here. And Pastor Gary is gonna come up now and he is going to deliver a message to you that the Lord has given him to give to you. And we are so happy to be part of this church family, even though right now we are living at a distance there has been no change in what God's work is doing in our hearts and in our lives and in our world. Good morning. We've been going through a series on Sunday mornings called Walk With God. But in light of the circumstances that we find ourselves in, we're gonna take a little break from that. We're going to focus on a couple different things and today because of the uncertainties that are facing us i'd like to be able to talk about what the bible teaches us about worry and fear so you know worry at its core is fear of the future it's a brooding sense that things are not going to turn out 
the way that you want them to. I have a quote here, the idea inherent in worry is of attempting to carry the burden of the future oneself and of unreasonable anxiety, especially about things over which one has no control. We all know what worry is like. We have all worried before. And the Bible makes it very clear that it gives us some guidance as to what we should do about these worried situations and worried times. First of all, we're instructed not to worry. You're familiar because we've studied it with Jesus' Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6, where he says, therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life. What you will eat or drink about your body, what you will put on is not, the li is not life more than food and the body more than clothing. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. So Jesus starts out with the idea that we have daily concerns. We have things that are heavy upon our heart on a daily basis and we need to be able to hand those off, to be able to trust in God because trusting in God is kind of the antithesis of worry here. Isaiah 41.10, fear not for I am with you. Be not dismayed for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And you know, further on, I, I've always looked at Isaiah 41.10, but I, I missed 41.13. It says, for I, the Lord your God, will hold your right hand. Saying to you, fear not, I will help you. Joshua 1.9, Joshua has this wonderful commission from the Lord to go in and conquer the land. And he says, have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid. Do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. There is no place we can go that the Lord is not with us. There is nothing we can do that he is not involved with. He sees everything that's going on in our lives. He sees everything that's going on in our culture. He knows the beginning from the end. And he has told us to not be afraid because he's there. The Lord is there with us. We have the situation in 2 Chronicles 20 where Israel was under attack by a conglomerate of different nations that were their neighbors and they were coming to destroy them and the Lord says listen all you Judah and you inhabitants of Jerusalem and you King Jehoshaphat thus says the Lord to you do not be afraid nor dismayed because of this great multitude for the battle is not yours, but God's. So we're instructed not to worry and the reason we don't have to worry is because God is there for us. He is the one who is going to fight our battles for us. And we will be victorious in him. Number three, we are to exchange our worry for the Lord's supernatural peace. And you all know this verse, Philippians 4, six and seven, be anxious for nothing, not even the coronavirus, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Now, it's not just praying, it's thanking God that he's answering our prayers. That is the faith that activates this whole thing. Do you want to exchange your worry for his peace? Because it says, when we make our requests known to him with thanksgiving, the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard our minds and our hearts through Christ Jesus. He puts his arms around our heart as a protection. We no longer have to build up walls against the things that are happening. We no longer have to be concerned about the things that are happening. He has our back, he has our hearts, he has us. We can exchange it for supernatural peace. I remember a number of years ago, I was facing a surgery and I am the biggest baby in the world. I will admit it, I am the biggest baby in the world when it comes to doctors and needles and surgeries. And I was facing a surgery and I remember where I was, I remember the room I was in, and I remember praying to God, and all of a sudden the peace of God 
just swept over the room and I was no longer concerned about the surgery that was coming up. He gave me his supernatural peace. What a wonderful gift he gives us when we're willing to take our worries and lay them at his feet, when we're willing to give up our anxiety and trade it for his peace because he's there to be our protector and our guide and our guard. Number four, we're to cast our cares upon Jesus. We cast all our cares upon him. And you know why? It says because he cares for us. We can give our cares to Jesus because he loves us so much. He wants to be part of our lives. He wants us to trust in him. He wants us to trust in him as Lord and Savior, but he wants us to trust in him every day for each situation in our lives. And as the cares come, they need to go to the cross. As the cares come, we need to lay them and cast them upon Jesus. So now where do we run when we have fear and anxiety? Psalm 18.2 says, The Lord is my rock and my fortress, and my deliverer, my God, my strength in whom I will trust, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. We go to the rock of our salvation. We meet him in his secret place. Psalm 91. If you want to follow me in your, on your iPhones or with the Bible, I'm going to be in Psalm 91 now for the balance of our time together. The Lord is almighty. Verse 1 says, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Now it's interesting because the psalmist identifies him as being El Elyon the supreme or uttermost. He is the most high God. He is the creator. He is the sustainer of the universe. And also the almighty is El Shaddai. He is the almighty God. There is none like him. There is no other God. He is God alone. Now, how do we dwell in the secret place? The Hebrew denotes dwelling in quietude, resting, remaining. We've been given an opportunity that we had no idea was going to come upon us, where some of the busyness of our day has been turned into quietude. This is a time to listen to the voice of God, to draw close to him, to rest in him, to remain with him. Now, it's wonderful to imagine that the Lord desires to have such a close relationship with us. You know what? I believe that God is blessed when we spend time with him. How could that be? How could we possibly bless God? But he does. He is blessed by it. He has offered us so much. And when we respond in love, and we respond in growing closer to him. I believe it brings pleasure to the heart of God. Now Jesus teaches us in Matthew 6 that we need to meet with the Lord one and one, one on one in prayer. Matthew 6, 6, but when you pray, go into your room. And when you've shut your door, pray to your father who is in the secret place. And your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And then Revelation 3.20, which we use for so many things. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, what will happen? He will come in and have fellowship, have, have a supper with us. And we, we apply that, that was to the church of Laodicea. It was to a church that was really cold toward the Lord and needed to get back in touch with the Lord. We use this for talking to people about coming to Christ, that he's knocking loudly at the door. But what he's doing here, as I believe in any of these circumstances, is he's saying, I have a place where I wanna meet with you. I wanna meet with you one 
on one. Now, if you're a sinner who has never given his life to Jesus, he wants to meet with you one on one and let's settle this issue because he wants to apply what he did on Calvary's cross to your life and to give you new life. If we are walking with him and we've been so busy that we've neglected our time with him, he wants to have us slow down and spend some time with him. Let's hear him knocking. Psalm 25, 14 says, the secret of the Lord is with those who fear him. He will show them his covenant. I believe he wishes to share more with us if we will simply take the time to do that. Secondly, the Lord is our refuge. I will say of the Lord, verse two, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in him will I trust. Now, again, a refuge, it's a quiet retreat from a pursuing enemy. Oh gosh, do you feel like the enemy is pursuing you? Do you feel like trouble is pursuing you, you need a refuge. You need a quiet place, a retreat from the pursuing enemy. A fortress is a tower of defense. It is strong and ready to meet all attacks of all enemies. God is both our safe, quiet resting place and he's our fortress where no harm can reach us. No attack can injure us. He's not only God, He's my God. In him will I trust. Is he your God? In him do you trust? To the exclusion of trusting others, do you trust him alone? There have been many people over the years who have said, well, I'm gonna try Christianity. I'm gonna try, I'll go ahead and pray that prayer and, and try that, but do you trust him alone? Is it not Jesus plus good works or Jesus plus going to church or Jesus plus random acts of kindness or whatever it might be? Is it Jesus alone? That is, he is our God to the exclusion of all others. Be careful not to trust anyone other than the Lord. Jeremiah 17 says this, thus says the Lord, cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength whose heart departs from the Lord. He shall be like the shrub in the desert and not see when good comes. He shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness in a salt land which is not inhabited. Oh my gosh, if you trust in man instead of God, he is saying that you are going to be like a shriveled shrub in a desert place instead of having the fullness of the river of living water, the river of life that God gives to those who trust in him. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is in the Lord, for he shall be like a tree planted by the waters, not a shrivel up shrub, but a tree planted by the waters, which spreads out its roots by the river and will not fear. Now listen to this. Will not fear when the heat comes, but its leaf will be green and will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. Our society right now is going through a problem as far as what is going to happen to the finances. What is going to happen to our economy? Well, he's saying that as you have put your trust in the Lord, the Lord will provide for you. You don't need to be anxious for a time of drought in your life because you're planted in and he is able to do that. Then thirdly, the Lord is our protector, verse three. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. Now, listen to that word, pestilence. He said as the protector, he's gonna deliver us from the snare of the fowler. That is the bird hunter who lies in wait for the bird who walks through the field hoping to flush out the birds and capture or kill them. He's gonna keep us from people that are going to try to destroy us, from people who are going to try to take advantage of us. And then it says he delivers us from the perilous pestilence. Charles Spurgeon says this, he who is a spirit, meaning God, can protect us from evil spirits. 
He who is mysterious can rescue us from mysterious dangers. He who is immortal can redeem us from mortal sickness. There is a deadly pestilence of error. We are safe from it if we dwell in the communion with the God of truth. If there is a fatal pestilence of sin, we shall not be infected by it if we abide with the thrice holy one. There is also a pestilence of disease. Hear this. And even from that calamity, our faith shall win immunity if it be of that high order which abides in God, walks on in calm serenity and ventures through all things for duty's sake. Faith by cheering the heart keeps it free from the fear which in times of pestilence kills more than the plague itself. And we can say that, that fear of what is going on in our society today is worse than the pestilence itself. And we don't need to worry because God has it. He will keep us from this pestilence. Number four, the Lord is a God of truth. He shall cover you with his feathers, in verse four. And under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and your buckler. He, he likens himself to a mother with his, the little chicks watching over them. He will cover us with his feathered wings. We can take safety in his wings. It's kind of like when you're a kid and you take refuge in your mother's skirt. <laughs> you come and you grab her, you become a Klingon. You cling on to your mother's, your mother's ankles and you know that there is safety there. Regardless of what else is happening, regardless of what boo-boos you get when you're out riding your bike or somebody says something to you, you can come to mom and she makes it all better and God is giving that as an example of how he cares for us. The truth of the Lord is a defense in battle. It is a shield from the sword strokes and arrows of the enemy. We know that from the armor of God, that our shield of faith is to prevent us from the flaming arrows of the enemy coming toward us. We know that. And then a buckler, which is the chain mail, protects our vital organs in the event that something makes it past the shield. Well, that's our shield of faith. That is the helmet of salvation, our breastplate of righteousness, our belt of truth our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying always in the spirit. We have the armor of God. He's reinforcing this in the Old Testament before we have gotten the teaching in the New Testament that he is our shield and he is our protection of our vitals. Next, the Lord protects us all the time. Verses five and six. Verse five, you shall not be afraid of the terror by night nor of the arrow that flies by day. So we don't need to worry about the open attack and we don't need to be worried about the attack that comes when we can't see clearly. Isaiah 54, 17, no weapon formed, what? Against you shall do what? Shall prosper. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. Verse six, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness Boy, one of the things with the coronavirus is they're saying, well, you don't know when it's coming because people don't know when they have it. But we're not to fear. We're not to be afraid of the terror by night, the arrow that flies by day, the pestilence that walks in darkness, or the destruction that lays waste at noonday. We don't need to fear the known. We don't need to fear the unknown because the Lord is there for us. He is our buckler, our shield, our strong tower, our fortress. The Lord is with us. And then the Lord gives us special protection in battle. Verse 7, a thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Oh, thank you, Jesus. You can protect us when things are just falling apart around us. Are things falling apart around you? He can keep it from coming near you. I think of this time with the people that are being uh, sequestered, quarantined, and our neighbors next door. You know, we can, we can reach out. 
I know we have to stay six feet away, but we can be ministering to people and letting them know that the Lord is the answer and that they don't need to fear and that you don't need to fear being used by the Lord during this time. If you go and talk to somebody, you don't need to fear, well, I'm going to get the virus. I don't believe you need to do that because the Lord, if he guides and directs you to talk to your neighbor, he's going to protect you from all of these things, whether seen or unseen. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. And we see this several times in the Old Testament where Israel was able to be rescued by the Lord and they saw the Lord's hand at work. We will be rescued by the Lord and we will see the hand of the Lord at work. There's a zone of protection the Lord provides for us, verses nine and 10. Because you have made the Lord who is my refuge, even the most high, your dwelling place. All right, there are a number of things that we have as an advantage because we have made the Lord our dwelling place. We have made the Lord our refuge. It says, no evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. He who makes God his refuge shall find him a refuge. He who dwells in God shall find his dwelling protected. I think of the Passover. Do you remember when the final plague of Egypt was the angel of death? And the angel of death was coming over the land and they, the children of Israel were instructed, take your Passover lamb, take the blood of the lamb and apply it to the lentils and the doorposts and when the angel comes and sees the blood applied, he'll pass over. When we have come to Jesus, we have taken his blood and applied it to the lentils of our heart and the doorposts of our heart. And when things come, he's going to pass over. Now, does that mean that everybody is going to live on this earth forever? No, it does not mean that. Does it mean that you're never going to get sick? No, it does not mean that you're never going to get sick. Are you ever going to be outside of God's love and God's care? No, you will never be outside of God's love and God's care. He's going to, he's going to provide protection for us. Trust in him and allow him to accomplish what his plans and purposes are in your life. The Lord provides us with angelic protection. Have you ever been in a situation where you could look back and say, oh my gosh, God rescued me from that situation. I made it through that situation. I, I've been involved with traffic things where all of a sudden, had the Lord not intervened, I, I would have been injured, I would have been killed. I'm sure you have similar stories of this, but understand that it says in the word, it says he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. Hebrews 1, 4, 14 says, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister to those who will inherit salvation? Angels have been given the task of keeping track of us and protecting us. Although we're never asked to contact the angels, we're never asked to communicate with them, pray to them, our communications with the Holy Spirit. But the Spirit of God can command the angels to watch over. So we have angelic protection. It says, how angels thus keep us, we cannot tell. Whether they repel demons, counteract spiritual plots, or even ward off more subtle physical forces of disease, we do not know. Perhaps we shall all one day stand amazed at the multiplied services which the unseen bands have rendered to us. It says in verse 12, in their hands they shall bear you up lest you dash your foot against a stone. Now we know that that is a verse that the devil tried to trip Jesus up on in his temptation in the wilderness. But we know that the Lord watches over us and keeps us safe. And then we have victory in, for, over our enemies in spiritual battles. We have victory over our enemies in spiritual battles. Verse 13, you shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent, you shall trample underfoot. 
safe in the refuge of the Lord, we can walk straight into the spiritual battles. We will tread upon the lion and the cobra. We will trample underfoot the young lion and the serpent. Whatever opponent comes against us, we will overcome. The strongest foe in power, the most mysterious in cunning, shall be conquered by the man or woman of God. Not only from stones in the way, but from serpents also we shall be safe. To men who dwell in God, the most evil forces become harmless. They wear a charmed life and they defy the deadliest ills. We are safe in the Lord. He tells us at the end of the book of Matthew in the, in the Great Commission that we are going to see miraculous things happen and we are going to be victorious over the enemy. And we need to stand firm in that. Then the Lord blesses and delivers his people, verses 14 to 16. Verse 14, because he has set his love upon me, that, that me there is the Lord. So he's saying, because you have set your love upon him, I will deliver you. I will set you on high because you have known my name. I think it's amazing in the scripture that we know that Jesus writes our name on his heart. We, 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 there's a, a white stone with a, with a special name that he gives us that we're going to give as being overcomers. I think of it this way. We're not just people. We're individuals that the Lord loves. He died for us. He knows us by name. He calls us. It says that he's our shepherd. And he knows the sheep. And he calls us by name. And because we've set our love upon him, we have the privilege of knowing him intimately, knowing his name. He shall call upon me. That's we shall call upon God. And he will answer us. He will be with us in trouble. He will deliver us. He will honor us. Oh my gosh. With long life, I will satisfy you and show you my salvation. I have no idea how many days I have left, but I do know this, that the Lord has determined a time. We're either going to be with him and be joined with him in death, or we're going to be here when he returns. And we need to pray for that quick return. Wouldn't it be great if nobody in this auditorium today would have to die, but that everybody would be reunited with the Lord when he comes back. But until that happens, we're gonna face challenges. Until that happens, we are going to face trouble, and he's given us the opportunity to not have to worry, to not have to fear, and that we can come to that secret place where God looks us right in the eye and says, I love you, do not be afraid. And that's where we wanna live. So what, there's so much anxiety today with the spread of this COVID-19, this coronavirus. But the Lord says to you, do not worry, do not fear for the Lord is almighty. He is our protector, he is our refuge, he is a God of truth. He is the one who brings us victory, the Lord who delivers and blesses his people. So let's go to the Lord. Let's meet him in our special place of communion. And let's learn to know him better, to love him more, to trust him more, to depend on him more, and to find our meaning and purpose in him. Isaiah 41.10. Fear not for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you who know the beginning from the ending and you know each of us and you call us by name, I pray, Lord, that you would just right now come upon these people that you would give them a sense of your presence, a sense of your peace, Lord, that they would be able to place their faith and trust wholly in you, that they would be able to exchange their anxiety for your supernatural peace. 
Lord Jesus, that you would just protect each household, protect each heart. And Lord Jesus, when this crisis has passed, may we look back and we see your footprints in the sand. We see your fingerprints over everything and we will rejoice and praise you for all that you have done because you are a God who loves us, who sees us, who cares for us, who provides for us, who protects us, and who loves us so much. Jesus, encourage every heart. Give hope where hope is needed. Strengthen faith where faith has faded. And come quickly, in Jesus' name.